Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Climate Confident Podcast. My name is Tom Raftery, and with me on the show today, I have my special guest, Michael. Michael, welcome to the podcast. Would you like to introduce yourself? Tom, thanks for having me. Yeah, Michael Bernard, Chief Strategist of the Future is Electric Strategy Consulting. That's one of the few hats I wear. I publish prolifically. Prolific is the most common word that's used. <laughs> uh, sit on an advisory board and assist organizations to figure out what to do. Uh, and I do that because I project uh, major areas of carbon problems and decarbonization solutions decades into the future. So if you know where it's going to be, you know where we have to spend money, time, and energy in the next few years in order to kind of get there. And you wrote a couple of articles recently, which caught my attention. And hence, I reached out and asked you to join me on the podcast. One of them was around decarbonizing marine traffic. And I wanted to talk about that. And you also wrote one on aviation, which we'll talk a little bit about as well. I wanted to chat about those because those are topics which, you know, are really heavy polluters, both marine and aviation, and ones which are really hard to decarbonize and ones which I haven't specifically addressed on this podcast before 110 episodes into the podcast or 112 episodes now, I think it is. <laughs> so, you know, you, you've ticked all the boxes, Michael. Thank you for that. Let's set a bit of context first. I mean, in terms of what scale problem are we talking about in terms of emissions? What percentage emissions do marine and aviation take up? And why are they so hard to decarbonize? Well, let's start with a preamble. Three big chunks of aviation, or three big chunks of transportation, ground, air, water. Um, and so the first part of the preamble is that all ground transportation is going to be electric. It's mm -hmm. going to be grid-tied or battery electric. You know, India, as an example, is at 83% electrification of all rail and heading for 100. China's at 72%, etc. cetera. All light vehicles, all medium vehicles, all buses, all long-distance trucking, it's all going to be electric. So ignore that. You know, that's just what the, that is. The only, but, the only thing I, I would say there, Michael, is none of that is controversial, I would have said, except maybe the long distance trucking where some people are still saying hydrogen's going to fix that because electric can't. Oh, well, they'd be wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> um, uh, the Right now, the battery energy density is sufficient for fully loaded semis, you know, large scale trucks, 500 miles. Um, Pepsi is taking its Tesla semis, 400 miles delivering, you know, it's sugar uh, battery acid to warehouses right now. It's doing 500 mile runs with uh, Frito-Lay chips. As soon as we're talking that range, we're talking a time requirement for a trucker to stop and take a mandated break. Yes. Uh, the U.S. Sure. transportation policy is um, an interesting one. The USA has a much greater percentage of ground freight transportation by road rather than rail or shipping than any other country in the world. Um, that's because they built the interstate highway for strategic defense purposes, exploited it. There's a bunch of other differentiators there. Don't want to get into them. Um, but battery energy density is just getting better. Yeah. And battery electric operating costs and maintenance are much lower. And it's trivial comparatively to get large-scale chargers to truck stops rather than to get hydrogen to truck stops. Um, yeah. you know, the United and electricity States is, is ubiquitous and hydrogen, although the most abundant element in the universe is not really abundant in terms of being ubiquitous for, for charging vehicles. Yeah, I, I'm just finishing off an assessment of the U.S. transportation blueprint, which will be published in the next you know day or two. Um, and so this is top of mind. But that said... If there's a niche for something that isn't electricity in ground transportation, it's a rounding error that I'm going to ignore. So we have okay. to look then the air and water shipping. Yep. Um, and there it's interesting, right? Well, what we have with aviation, um, you know, there's kind of three chunks to this for aviation. The first is you're burning a fossil fuel, kerosene, Jet A. And when you burn a fossil fuel, you're taking millions of year old, you know, stored CO2 and returning it in all its glory to the atmosphere. Uh, so that's kind of problem one. Problem mm -hmm. two is when you burn a fossil fuel in the atmosphere, you release not nitrous oxide, N2O. Uh, and N2O is um, uh, a really potent greenhouse gas. It's long-lasting, and it's 
265 times as potent a greenhouse gas as CO2. Now, that's a small percentage from modern jet engines, mm -hmm. but it's that multiplier and the persistence are concerning. The third is contrails. Those lo lovely little lines in the sky, okay. well, they're up in the stratosphere. They persist and they actually cause um, more reflection of uh, heat back to the Earth in the form of infrared. It's just one of those annoying things. So we kind of have to solve for those three problems, which means we want to burn a lot less stuff in the sky and we want to fix the contrail problem. And so let's just start with aviation and move on to marine shipping, if, you know, if you don't mind, because sure. I'll say that, that combination is, depending on how you count it, one to 5% of global CO2 emissions. Like right now, we're not counting methane properly. So the numbers tend to be about pure CO2, but that's not the right number to focus on. Unfortunately, that's what most of the numbers look at. So shipping, global shipping, is in the same scale. It's up there. It's like roughly right. the same CO2 emissions. So this is a significant segments and wedges we have to kind of yank down somehow. Um, so both of those. But let's focus on... and. and I'll finish it off with marine shipping, just one bit on marine shipping, which is marine shipping doesn't have contrails. Yay. But it does have something that uh, aviation doesn't have, black carbon emissions. So mm -hmm. particulate matter, unburnt hydrocarbons, crap like that, which also has a very high global warming potential. So we want to reduce the amount of stuff we burn in ship engines as much as possible. And ship engines also produce a lot of nitrous oxide, so we have to make sure we reduce those. So that's kind of the, the big chunks, right? It's like in the yeah. scale of like, it's over 1% for each mode of all global warming. And both of them have shot upwards in terms of usage since 1990. I mean, 1990 is kind of the, the date line for when we consider, you know, us, the, us as a society to actually have been serious about dealing with climate change. Kyoto Protocol and the creation of the UN IPCC were around then. And most of the benchmarks are 1990, yep. which is kind of amusing because global aviation and global marine shipping have shot upward radically with massive increases in emissions since 1990. Not necessarily the wisest thing we've ever done as a society <laughs> or an economy, um, but there are answers. So going back to the solution space for aviation, um, there's a few factors here. The first is, are battery electric airplanes possible and viable? And the answer is yes. We can do right now, with current battery energy density, we can do small planes, general aviation, light aircraft, or, you know, four or five passengers, nine passengers, which are fully electric. And we can get, um, you know, uh, 200 to 400 kilometers of range, depending upon the operating conditions. For commercial aviation, we need to also allow for divert and other uh, concerns and circling over the airport. So, you know, small planes, 200 kilometers, we have enough range for uh, all the circling otherwise. Um, so that's kind of statement one. Statement two, though, is hybrid electric works just fine in aircraft. We can run actually 400, 500 kilometers with a 60 to 100 passenger um, jet or, you know, a turboprop, or, you know, for example, Hart Aerospace's 30 uh, passenger uh, hybrid aircraft, we can do that entirely on batteries and then have the generator, the hybrid generator, be suitable only for divert and uh, circling. And so what we can do is put all the reserve in the generator and fly right. electrically as long as we don't have to divert or circle. Um, so boom, right? That means we can actually decarbonize all propeller-driven aircraft pretty much today with today's battery energy density. Um, there's a bit of stuff there about the hybridization. These are all new airframes. So that's statement yep. one is we're not going to replace, we're not going to put batteries and electric motors in existing airframes for the most part. Uh, they're not designed for it. They're engineered sure. to have fuel in the wings and for that fuel load to diminish over the course of the flight and the mean gross takeoff weight calculations are all around fuel and stuff like that. And so batteries, they you want to put them low in the plane. You want to have different 
Uh, you want to have wing, you know, basically to get the range we need, you have to go on a bit more glider profiles today. Okay. Right Right now, we uh, Jet A has so much energy density, we just push blocks of wood through the air. And we don't really care that much. They're aerodynamic. We have a lot more levers to pull on that. We have okay. different characteristics of the plane. We want to change the glide aspect ratio a bit um, more to you know earlier uh, flight patterns for non-electric engines. So we're not just going to take a dash eight, yank out the motor, put in a new motor, yank out the tanks, put in some batteries, and fly it, except on the shortest routes. I'll take, um, you know, I, I live in Vancouver, British Columbia, which is where I'm talking from this morning. Okay. Uh, you know, Tom, I think you're in Seville in Spain. Correct. Yeah, right yeah, side. Yeah. <laughs> um, also a beautiful part of the world. I'd love to visit sometime. But we have uh, globally something that everybody knows in electric aviation, which is we have Harbor Air. Harbor Air is a float plane operation yes. that, you know, has routes to the Vancouver Island and up to Squamish and, you know, around the coast. And it's great. Uh, it's 30 minutes walk from where I'm sitting. I've taken it many times. My mom lives over in the island. And it's downtown to downtown service. And they have Magni X, the electric motor, uh, uh, aviation motor company, which is sadly diverting a bit into hydrogen fuel cells. It was a you know, bit of a mistake on their part. I think it's a strategic blunder. Um, but they, they have actually replaced the drivetrain on one of the old uh, float planes. And so they're working through certification and they'll actually pressing that into service for short routes. Okay. So they'll be able to do Vancouver to Victoria, which is, you know, 20 kilometers, um, you know, uh, a dozen, you know, a dozen or 15 miles as a crow flies or as the float plane flies. Um, and that will be just fine. Sure. But most routes are not that short. <laughs> yeah. And most operators <laughs> won't be satisfied with a plane which is suitable for 50 kilometers or less. And so, you know, repowering old uh, airframes is not going to be the same pattern as we've seen historically. Like right now, what we see is a lot of older aircraft with new engines um, or replacement engines in them, not as much in electrification. It's going to be custom-built airframes. So that's the bottom end of the market. And it's a smaller segment. Um, I I've ended up fl flying a lot of turboprops I flew from Toronto to Montreal a lot on turbo props off the island airport. Um, I fly when I fly to Victoria from the airport here, as opposed to a float plane. I go down to the uh, Vancouver airport and I get in a turbo prop that takes me eleven minutes of flight time to the Vancouver uh, the Vancouver Island airport, mm -hmm. um, and then rent a car and go see my mom. Um, but most people, when they get in aircraft these days, are getting a narrow-bodied, twin-engined, big jet-engined aircraft. Yeah, uh, there's the been a bit of a revolution. Or the A320s. Yep. Um, you know, the uh, and so you kind of look at those and you go, okay, why are why are we have why do we have two engines as opposed to four? Why have the air the the size of the aircraft changed? Well, the the answer is those big two big engines are 55% efficient at turning kerosene into forward motion at 30,000 feet at optimum cruising speed. <laughs> right. right? And 55% efficient for burning fossil fuels Pretty is good. really good. Yeah. These are miracles of technology. I mean, like the internal combustion engine, I, I love the engineering amazing stuff in the internal combustion engine, and I can't wait for both of them to go away because they're a problem. <laughs> um, so let's talk about that longer path. Like the shorter path over the next 30 years, it's going to be easy to decarbonize. All of general aviation, all of turboprops, all those things are relatively trivial to do. But once we start going 1,000 kilometers and to hub and spoke airports with, you know, an A320 or an A321J with A3... I, I, looked at them recently and the A321J is like the most efficient it has little, little canard winglets and all that stuff. It's insanely <laughs> fuel efficient compared to its predecessors. Um, I had to benchmark something for uh, uh, energy consumption for, I think it was, was doing Edmonton airport, a projection of electrifying all aviation through 2100 as if we could run everything on a battery electric, how much could we use? Different story. So the, 
if we take an A320 a thousand uh, a thousand kilometers, uh, you're not going to do that on batteries today. Yep. And so, so what are you going to do it on? And that, that's going to be running at thirty thousand feet, and it's going to be generating contrails for part of its operational pattern, especially at night. Um, that's the time it's worse to generate tra- um, contrails. Um, and it's going to be producing CO2, and it's going to be producing nitrous oxide. So the answer is sustainable aviation biofuels. Um, and when we look at that, I say, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff being discussed. There's hydrogen being discussed. Yeah. People are pretending that hydrogen is fit for purpose when it isn't. Um, okay. I'll explain that. And then there's people who are saying, well, what we're going to do is make synthetic uh, Jet A or synth- other synthetic fuels from hydrogen and carbon and oxygen. We're going to push those molecules together ourselves, and then we're going to make a fuel that's fit for putting into current jet engines. So we are going to be burning something in jets for a long time. If we consider uh, hydrogen, well, hydrogen, you know, you can put in a gas turbine and, you know, use it as a jet fuel, just as we use it as rocket fuels today, well, similar. Uh, but there's a lot of problems with hydrogen. Remember I said you had to rebuild a, the, an air, uh, build an airframe specifically for battery electric? Yep. Well, you really have to do that for hydrogen. So... Airbus have, Airbus have published its blended wing hydrogen kind of design. Is that what you mean? Yeah. The, the problem with hydrogen is, so remember I said there's fuel in the wings. Yep. That means it's supported by the air, so you don't have to engineer to support that weight in the connection points of the body. Right? As you move forward, the wings are lifting up and the fuel in them is lifting up, and you don't have to worry about that in terms of your mean gross tonnage of weight uh, calculations for fuel requirements. But hydrogen is different. So first off, there's two aspects to hydrogen. That we can have it as a gas or you can have it as a liquid. Mm. As a gas, it's, you know, really nicely energy uh, dense by mass. A kilogram of hydrogen is about equivalent to four liters of gasoline, right? right. So that's quite energy dense. The problem is the volume. <laughs> hydrogen is pretty much the least condensable gas that exists that we know about, right? And, it's a, and this is physics, so we know about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's not like, it's got like, time. it's got two atoms. It's got nothing going on there. Um, the, you know, and so the helium molecule is actually smaller, but that's the only thing in the universe smaller and more diffuse than, than uh, hydrogen. And so inert. hydrogen, and inert. <laughs> um, yeah, not helpful at all. Uh, so the, <laughs> The hydrogen problem then is, well, how much do we compress it? So if we take a fuel cell car, in order to get any range, we have to compress hydrogen in gaseous form to 750 atmospheres, which means, you know, take the Earth's atmosphere at sea level and multiply that by 750. That's a lot. Yep. Um, you know, the uh, if we take a compressor in a standard refrigeration unit, that's at about 50 atmospheres. If I remember right. correctly from my time scuba diving in college, the scuba tanks were at about 200 uh, bar, uh, which I, I'm not sure how, how bars relate to atmospheres. Very closely but... related. Yeah, it's very close. It's very, it's, there's just slight differences between the two. Right. And, and so 750 is a lot, but still that gives you uh, 400 or 500 kilometers of range with a car that's rolling along the ground. It's not taking off <laughs> with lots of freight. <laughs> so all the demonstrators of uh, hydrogen aviation by, you know, Zero Avia and people like that, they've been using gaseous hydrogen. And what that means is there's no room inside the airplane at all for anything except the hydrogen gas tanks. <laughs> um, and so if you're trying to use gaseous hydrogen, it won't work. And so no, you can't, you know, like you're immediately running into the physics of the problem. You can't compress it sufficiently, no matter what quality of tanks you use to get it down to an energy density that's remotely near kerosene. You can't put it in the wings because there's no room in the wings for all that volume. Sure. So yeah. it has to go in the cabin. So everybody's saying, okay, we need liquid hydrogen. And liquid hydrogen is amazing stuff. It's problem though, is it's about. 20 degrees above absolute zero that hydrogen turns into a liquid. So minus 250 centigrade. Yeah. That's 
a long way down. It's like hundred, it's almost three hundred degrees colder than humans like to have it. You know, we're probably at 20, 21, 19 degrees Celsius in our very respective places. Go a long way colder, like almost 300 <laughs> degrees colder. Yeah. Uh, and so how we say, can we, well, can we put it in the wings then, away from the passengers? And the answer is no. At that temperature, hydrogen likes to, uh, liquid hydrogen wants to boil off. And all that is, is it, it the liquid evaporates into a gas. Mm. And we have to prevent that because it really wants to boil off fast. And it, and when it turns into a gas, again, it's um, A, changing the volume radically, and B, sure. hydrogen gas really likes to explode. Like, <laughs> let's just take natural. Yeah, it, it's the problem with hydrogen. It's a great thing about it, but it's a problem. So let's just compare and contrast natural gas, something most of us know about, with mm -hmm. hydrogen. Because, you know, there's various initiatives to try and put it into people's homes to replace gas heaters and gas stoves. And I, I will share that that's dumb as a box of putrescent purple hammers. Um, <laughs> it's, it's a stupid, stupid idea. It's going to die. But we're going through a weird hype cycle about hydrogen. So hydrogen, natural gas, um, it's 5 to 15% of, as a ratio to the air around you, that it can ignite. Less okay. and it won't ignite, more and it won't ignite. Not enough oxygen, too little, you know, too much of the other stuff. And then it needs about um, uh, hundreds of degrees Celsius as a spark to ignite. Right. And now, and that means that in the United States, for example, 4,000 homes, um, uh, 4,000 buildings burn or explode every year because of natural gas. We end up in this situation. And dozens of people die from natural gas building explosions already. So now let's take hydrogen. Hydrogen is 4% to 76% <laughs> as a ratio to air. It will ignite. And it's a hundred, uh, uh, it's more than a hundred degrees Celsius lower spark point. So a spark that won't ignite natural gas will ignite hydrogen. A, if you get too much natural gas, you may, you know, pass out, but it's not going to blow up. But yeah. Hydrogen will just fill the space, and the more hydrogen there is there, and it sparks, the bigger explosion. And now let's consider what a plane is. It is a pressurized aluminum tube flying at 30,000 feet. Mm -hmm. Let's have a hydrogen leak inside that. <laughs> we don't allow smoking in aircraft anymore. Uh, but I'm going to say that, you know, despite there being smoke detectors in washrooms, people still smoke in washrooms in airplanes. They're stupid that way. And they have but vape you, pens that they use. In, even if you think pens, about the, the coffee machines, the, the temperature of the coffee machines in there. Uh, there's all sorts of electrical equipment that you could just have a sparking electrical connection. And you don't want hydrogen inside the plane with the passengers at all. Yeah. You, can't right and so but you can't put it in the wings because the boil off the physics of liquid hydrogen means that if you don't want to lose it all to evaporation you have to put it in big insulated ball-shaped tanks thermally that's the most efficient thing to get the minimum surface area to the maximum volume sure right it's just physics and, and so boil off uh, for liquid natural gas is like one and a half percent, one to one and a half percent per day um, on tankers. And it's going to be two to three percent minimum for hydrogen if we tried to ship hydrogen. And so, you know, you take enough jet fuel and you put it in tanks and it's boiling off. You got to find it. You've got to vent that. You've got to have detectors. You've got to do a whole bunch of stuff. But it's inside the fuselage. These big globular tanks have to be inside the fuselage, where normally you put passengers or cargo. Yeah, or and luggage. it's not in the wings, our luggage. And it's not in the wings. So it's not supported from an engineering perspective by the wings when it takes off. It's in the fuselage, which means it has to be calculated into the mean gross takeoff weight. So the longer distance you want to travel, the more you have to carry, and by far, it cuts directly into passenger or freight mass. And so 
the projections that are based about being able to fly the same distances with um, hydrogen, liquid hydrogen, as with kerosene with the same number of passengers are specious nonsense. I think it was um, a Fly Zero you know, released a model that presented that we could take a 280 passenger plane, uh, 5,000 kilometers with hydrogen. No, it's not going to happen. So it's not going to happen for two reasons. The first reason is, do you, do you know how much of a, a certified um, safety oriented industry aviation is? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it costs a lot to certify those things. The FAA and EASA really care about people not blowing up in airplanes, <laughs> especially commercial ones. Thank, if you want to thankfully. fly, it's yeah, thankfully, <laughs> it is literally. It's much safer to get in a modern jet aircraft than to cross the street in a city. Hmm. Um, statistically, you're much more likely to injure yourself or be hit by something on the city street than to have the most remote problems flying 5,000 kilometers in an aircraft. For On a per kilometer basis, aviation is the safest form of travel we have because we the industry has done this amazing job of focusing on reducing risk and certifying aircraft. And so as we certify aircraft, well, the FAA's certification process, it's all about safety. It's all about yeah. things not blowing up. It's all about redundancy. Hydrogen in passenger aircraft doesn't pass the sniff test for certification. So that's kind and of that, statement one. Now, air, and then there's the oh, economics. The, oh, well, yes. Then there's the economics. <laughs> I was actually going to go to a different place, and then I'll get to economics. Okay, go on. Um, so... The next thing is the lifting wing model, the vision. In that case, what you're really doing is expanding the body so it merges into the wing. So you have a lot more room inside the body. So you can put the hydrogen tanks and the passengers in a big, and have the same number of passengers surrounding the hydrogen tanks. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Mm. Um, so that's kind of statement one. Yes, it's possible to do that, and it does resolve this massive amount of space and the stuff, and you can do the engineering for the wings. Um, but you don't resolve the safety concerns. You don't resolve the massive temperature disparity between these big globular tanks of hydrogen and these warm, squishy humans that are actually the point of this exercise. <laughs> um, the next problem you face, of course, is that battery energy density is going to eat the bottom of the aviation market. Yeah. And you don't need a big Airbus lifting wing body for battery electric. You can put a lot of the batteries in the wings. You can put other batteries in the base and you can move them around, but you have to engineer for um, balance of the aircraft. But that's entirely viable when you design an aircraft for those characteristics for landing and takeoff. Uh, but you don't need a, a big, weird lifting wing thing that you don't that doesn't work with gantries in airports or anything like that. Fair. Yeah. 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 Um, and so you kind of like look at this and go, okay, so the bottom end of the market, we're going to get up to, up to turbo you know, turbo props of a hundred passengers in you know a decade and a half. That means the bottom half of the market is building recognizable aircraft. They're Different, slightly different, but not massively different. We can use a lot of the same stuff we do today. We can tweak stuff. We get rid of exhausts and stuff like that. But then as battery energy density improves, oh, we're going to be able to do 1,000 kilometer trips with 150 people. Then we're going to be able to do 2,000 kilometer trips with 200 people. And then my projection is, based upon the curves, I think it likely, given what I know of electrochemistry and how much room to maneuver we have and all the innovation that's going into battery electric, we'll mm -hmm. probably be able to do a Pacific flight with passengers um, in, you know, 100 plus passengers by 2070 or so, 2060, 2070. And then in another 30 or so years, by 2100, we'll re start replacing most of the airframes. So my projection for aviation is battery electric for most aviation by 2100. That's civilian. Uh, military is <laughs> yeah, a separate weird topic. Let's not discuss it. Um, but for civilian aviation, I project full battery electric is possible around you know the, the three quarters of the way through the century. And then that means that the airframes will slowly be replaced. 
So that's kind of the battery electric story. And that's good news, but it does mean that putting hydrogen into weird planes as a diminishing market... That makes less and less sense. Makes less and less sense. And, and then you mentioned the economics. Hmm. Ah, there, there's a lot of ascientific, economically illiterate projections of hydrogen, green hydrogen costs out there. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about where hydrogen comes from briefly. Let's talk about two, you know, three colors of hydrogen. The hydrogen color comes from coal or natural gas, mostly from natural gas, but if coal gas, which is just more methane mixed with other pollutants, is the same stuff. And they both go through processes which strip the hydrogen off the hydrocarbon gas. And you leave your stuff with a bunch of CO2 or a bunch of pollutants, which we throw into the atmosphere. And then you've got hydrogen, which is pure. And when you burn it, it only delivers water. Oh, well, ignore the man behind the curtain. <laughs> um, and that hydrogen costs, you know, maybe, you know, 78 cents or something like that to manufacture. And then you can buy it for a buck, buck 50 per kilogram. Right. And so that's, you know, in wholesale lots yep. without distribution. But uh, but let's take um, the green and black hydrogen, you can, the gray hydrogen, which is the you know, natural gas stuff you can get in California at gas stations for fuel cell vehicles. 12 to $18 per kilogram. Wow. That, and that's about because 100 hydrogen, kilometers range, right? Uh, it's longer than that. You, you, the, um, you, you can actually get, uh, with a Mirai, I think it's uh, 500, 600 kilometers range. No, but, no uh, per, per oh, kilo. Sorry. Yes. Per kilo, yeah. So it's about 100, uh, and so, 100 kilometers per kilo. Well, which is why Toyota gives away $15,000 worth of free hydrogen with every MRI they sell, new or refurbished. Oh, does that work? <laughs> it doesn't. <laughs> um, but the reason that you know, we can make green hydrogen for like a buck or something, and it costs 15 bucks retail, is because it's really hard. All that problems of compression, mm. all that leakage, it likes to leak. And then to recompress it to 750 bar, a high, a fuel cell car pumping station, is about $2.5 million. Oh, wow. Whereas a supercharger location for a Tesla is like $250,000. Yeah, kind of like look at the economics there. Yeah, the hydrogen's yeah. more expensive than the electricity. You know, that's part of why all ground transportation will electrify. But hydrogen, let's take it and say, when, well, what if we get rid of the problem with all the CO2 that comes off that stuff? It's blue hydrogen. We'll do carbon capture and sequestration. Well, that's going to significantly, there's first of all, best case scenario, there's a 15% extra power required at that step, which is just capturing in the CO2, well, right? Yeah. And, and then you've got to do something with the CO2, which means you pipe it somewhere and put it underground. And that's only, that's for uh, carbon capture, which is 85% efficient, single pass carbon capture. So every kilogram, instead of coming with, you know, eight kilos of CO2, comes with one and a half kilos of CO2. Is that, that's a win-ish, <laughs> not a great win, but it's more expensive, right? So that retail price goes up because the wholesale cost of manufacture goes up. The multipliers are all the same. You know, it's going to be going to be more expensive. Uh, so let's talk about the other one, green hydrogen. You know, it's like take renewable electricity and take water and you know put them together and split the H two O into two H's and one O, and voila, we have hydrogen. Well, that's more expensive than blue hydrogen, and it's probably always going to be more expensive than blue hydrogen, except when natural gas prices peak, as they did last year. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of excitement in the green hydrogen community when green hydrogen was cheaper than hydrogen from natural gas. But neither price point was remotely economically sustainable. Yeah. It doesn't matter if green hydrogen is cheaper than gray hydrogen if no one can afford either. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> At least for energy. Fair. Fair. Um, you know, it, it's like saying, okay, Tom, your heating bill has gone up to 2,000 euros a month. But if we replace it with hydrogen, it's only 1,800 euros a month. Aren't you happy? <laughs> no, you're not. Yeah, you want yeah. your heating bill to be 200 euros a month like it used to be. 
<laughs> um, and that's kind of the hydrogen story every time you look at it. So we look at hydrogen, we say, okay, it's going to be more expensive. Green hydrogen is more expensive than blue hydrogen, and it always will be. So an electrolyzer plant to manufacture sufficient volumes of hydrogen is a massive industrial facility. Electrolyzers are about one of 28 components in them. The electrolyzer is the only non-commoditized, non-off-the-shelf component in the plant. That means everything else in the plant is already cost-optimized because we manufactured thousands or tens of thousands or millions of them. The electrolyzer is the only thing in the plant that's going to get cheaper. That means the capital expenditure on the electrolyzer plant is still going to remain a significant economic factor. Sure. That matters because that means we have to use it a lot more. We have to have a high utilization in order to minimize the capex component of the hydrogen cost. It means we used to use it like 60 plus percent, 80 plus percent, preferably 90 plus percent. And as soon as we say that, we say, well, we're not going to be using it for a third of the year off excess renewables because it's just going to be really, really expensive. Hmm. We might That might be an argument for hydrogen grid storage where, you know, we really have a strategic need and we're willing to pay stupid amounts of money for it. <laughs> there are better alternatives there I won't get into. You can make an argument for that, but you can't make an argument for something we use every day being really expensive. So what you have to do then is you have to get firmed electricity to maximize the utilization of the in infrastructure. Firmed electricity means we have to have renewables, transmission, storage, administrative costs, regulatory burden, which puts it up around a hundred bucks a megawatt hour. Now it's not going to be 30 bucks a megawatt hour electricity running these electric electrolyzers. It's going to be firm electricity, which is more like what you get out of your pump. Do you, do you happen to know what you pay per kilowatt hour in Seville? We're at about 20 cent per kilowatt hour. I mean, it, it varies with time of day and that kind of thing, yep. but it's in around 20 cent per kilowatt hour. Yeah. And, and that's what you're getting. That's what these electrolyzers are going to be running on, right? And so yeah. it, that means that the um, oper operation expense and the capital expense push the price per kilogram way up. If you drop the operational expense by only using intermittent electricity, you're maximizing the capital X portion. You can't, you're only going to bring this in so far. You're only going to bring the capital expense in. So hydrogen is always going to be more expensive. These claims of $1 per kilogram green hydrogen manufacturing are specious nonsense. Um, McKinsey and other companies like that are, I'm just going to be saying, they, they must be huffing hydrogen to believe these numbers. <laughs> they they have, they're, they are, um, in a lot of cases, many of these analyses are done by school graduates who have the best intent and her, her heart's in the right place, but they wouldn't know a periodic table if it hit them in the head. <laughs> and so they just don't understand the physics. They don't understand the infrastructure of the economics because they've never been in an industrial plant and looked at the components. They don't know how that works. So these projections of cost reductions based upon making electrolyzers cheaper and they won't get nearly as cheap as people believe either because there's a whole bunch of stuff going on inside there. Mm. Um, just don't hold water, right? So hydrogen is always going to be more expensive. That's just the nature of the beast. It's I've done the math on this. My my jet gut is six to eight dollars per kilogram delivered is the best case scenario for non liquid hydrogen. Right. All right. Yeah. So that's six to eight times the cost of diesel or gas in North America, and it's still multiples in Europe, yeah. right? So 3x the cost, 3 or 4x the cost of the uh, same amount of energy as uh, Jet A. So very expensive. But then we get to the next piece, which says, okay, what do we do here? Well, uh, what about if we make a liquid fuel? Like, let's make liquid fuels out of that. Well, if you start with hydrogen being extensive, anything you make out of it is more expensive. <laughs> sure. <laughs> so the entire hydrogen and synthetic fuels space, like uh, Audi's blue diesel, it's nonsense. Um, Michael Lieberg said it very well recently. He said, um, the hydrogen hype is going to take till 20 for energy is going to take till 2030 to abate because it takes time to deprogram a cult. 
<laughs> Every time, you know, actual spreadsheet jockeys look at actual numbers, they go, we can't use this. And so hydrogen ain't going to be there. All those reasons. Um, and it doesn't cure the contrail problem. Contrail problems are just an operational thing. You can actually fly a plane 500 meters lower and get 60 to 80 percent contrail reduction. So we're going to see a lot of just operational, minor operational changes, which will do that. Um, and okay. hydrogen, if we burn hydrogen in a gas turbine, it actually makes more contrails. Electric airplanes make no contrails. Um, Sounds good. Burning hydrogen still creates N2O. Electric airplanes create no N2O. So yep. aviation, biofuels, on the other hand, well, biofuels, well, let's talk about biofuels. We've been able to make biofuels for 6,000 years. So yeah. biofuel, here's the biofuel process. We ferment some stuff, make beer. Um, that's 8,000-year-old technology. We distill it into alcohol. That's a 6,000-year-old technology. We can burn alcohol. We actually burn it in cars today. We can get corn ethanol in Brazil and run a, a dual-fueled cars entirely on alcohol in Brazil today. We've been able to do this for you know, forever. Um, and then the last bit. We don't actually, alcohol has about a third the energy density as kerosene, which is jet fuel. Sure. So how do we make diesel or kerosene out of alcohol? Well, Otto von Diesel, I think that was his name. I know his last name was Diesel. The guy we named Diesel after mm -hmm. made the first synthetic diesel, the first biodiesel in 1890. <laughs> I've been making a biological process biofuels uh since the 1890s um you know and so we kind of like look at that and go okay well that's great let's move forward um there are now eight pathways for biofuels from waste streams um let's talk the, the one i lean into most is stock cellulosic biofuels um, you have a uh, stock of corn with the ear at the top uh -huh. Get this so you can actually where's ah uh, there it is <laughs> here at the top and the stock of corn and that right now we make into ethanol but that's stupid because it's calories for animals or people so let's instead take the ear of corn and feed animals and people with it take the stock which is the same stuff it's cellulose it's hydrogen carbon carbon and oxygen in a different format mulch it up throw it into fermenter distill it and put it into one of these upgrading processes that takes ethanol to kerosene or diesel. We have that pathway alone for just the segments of aviation and marine shipping in my projections that will actually require biofuels has enough energy in it just from our current crops of corn, wheat, and rice globally to fuel all of the biofuels we need as long as we don't waste it on ground transportation. Right. Yeah. Gotcha. So rationality has to prevail. We have to electrify ground transportation and we have to electrify as much of aviation and marine shipping as possible, which is easy. So biofuels are about a 30% price uh, premium on other fuels, right? And so it's going to cost more um, and that's just what it is. Uh, and so if it costs more, then you know we're going to use less of it. We're going to do some other stuff, but it costs a lot less than hydrogen or synthetic fuels. Okay. So, but in, my, in, in terms of marine shipping, um, well, 40% 40, 40 of marine shipping today is for moving fossil fuels around. So if we get rid of fossil fuels, 40% of the requirement for marine shipping goes away, right? Absolutely. Um, now, Paul Martin and I are having arguments about this. Um, <laughs> Paul Martin is a founding member of the Hydrogen Science Coalition, and we agree on 98% of stuff. We disagree on aspects of details. So he is, I, I tend to defer to him on stuff like this, but it depends on where we look at the question. Um, he is focused on, he says, the numbers he quotes are 15 to 25% of a barrel of oil are used for products which are of value which we don't burn. Mm -hmm. um, so other industrial feedstocks and durable goods and stuff like that. And his perspective is we're going to continue to do that. I, I suspect it's going to be less right now the non-burnable products include asphalt for our roads. Um, we can actually just grind up our roads and reuse that asphalt. We don't need more roads. Let's just and we can just grind up the asphalt, reuse it, and repave roads with 
we used asphalt. At a certain point, we don't need more asphalt. Right. It's already cheaper to recycle for most jurisdictions than it is to buy new asphalt. And it's a waste byproduct yeah. of refiners. They're, they're practically giving it away. Um, same with bunker fuel for marine shipping. Resid is stuff they can't do anything else with. They've got it down to, they've taken everything else of value out of Resid, including diesel and kerosene and gasoline and aromatics and benzenes. Um, and the Resid is the stuff that still burns, <laughs> but if they give it to ships and the ship's engines burn it. Um, so that means I think it's not going to be 15 to 25% to percent of the barrel of oil, which persists. We're still going to be pumping oil out. It's going to be lower than 20% of oil will be pumped. We'll be doing nothing burnable with it, which means that all the stuff we currently fractionated into with a whole bunch of stuff, majority burnable stuff, has to be majority non-burnable stuff. And then we end up with a bunch of stuff which is waste, which we don't have any value streams for. So I suspect the economics lower that further because every barrel of oil produces less value. Right. Um, yeah. That's kind of my thinking on this. And we have um, Paul and I are you know having a bit of a debate, uh, which I tend to defer to him on as well. He spent a lot of time finding biological replacements for fossil fuels in his career. And he knows how hard that is. But the biofuel question makes it clear that we can do that for a substantial portion of that. And I suspect we'll do a bit more of that. And the final point, though, is fuel prices are going to go up for marine shipping. That's just the okay. nature of the beast, especially for, sure. you know, um, let's actually talk about, let's separate marine shipping into three categories. Um, first first categorization, inland, short mm -hmm. sea, which is like near shore, it's like between Sweden and Norway, um, you know, Sweden and Germany. And, you know, let's say Natchez across the Mediterranean from you for like Seville, you know, if Seville has a port, does Seville have a port? Yeah, uh, it does. Yeah, yeah. The Guadalquivir. It's it's where a lot of the South American gold came back in the times of the the the, the Spanish. It wasn't an empire really, but we call it an empire just for the sake. Yeah, but Seville to Morocco, for example, that's short yeah. sea. Um, all those inland and shorter portions in the short sea, the near shore shipping, we'll just go battery electric. We already have yeah, yeah. uh, 1,300 passenger cruise ships and the, um, the three gorges running three-hour tours on 7.5 megawatt hour battery. We already have uh, autonomous container ship and shipping in being pr being um, prototyped and tested in the Yangtze in China and also in Norway. I think it's Norway. Yeah. It's one of the Scandinavian Norway. countries. Yeah, the, the Yerkland. Yeah. Yep. Uh we already have massive amounts of ferries electrified globally. And so we can see the pattern here. And the pattern is very clear. I'll, I'll give you the very clear pattern. Um, if bulk shipping drops because we're getting rid of bulk coal, oil, and gas, and a lot of the steel, um, then container shipping as a ratio increases. And containers have this wonderful thing. They're the perfect size for battery packs. <laughs> right. Tesla and Vaxilla already deliver grid and behind the meter storage batteries in container sized packages to use, which are stacked and shipped exactly the same way any other container is, except they got big plugs on the outside. And so, <laughs> so as we sit, sit there and look at that, we can say, oh, okay, we can get like a container with a few megawatt hours of lithium ion or similar chemistry cell batteries and we can winch it onto a ship mm -hmm. and it can sail to a port and it can get winched off with all the rest of the containers and put in a special part of the port where it's plugged into charge yeah and charge batteries go into the ship i i you know spend a lot of time looking at for weird reasons of my own container shipping logistical stuff and the can there's uh, only a handful of the, of software packages, and they all know exactly what each container is and its status, and they already deal with containers which require electrical connections because they're freezer containers. Right. They have to be put in a specific part of the um, transshipment lot and plugged in by a human being, and when they are unplugged, they're put into the container ship in a specific spot, and a crew member plugs them in to maintain 
those things as frozen quantities. So this yeah. is just standard stuff. This is all very operationalized. All those containers turn into big batteries. They get winched out of ships. They get winched back into ships. And they get winched onto trains. Trains come into transshipment ports. Ships come into transshipment ports. Containers get winched off of one and onto the other. Mm -hmm. Batteries are exactly the same thing. One of the biggest provinces in Germany did an assessment of rail, by the way. And they said hydrogen is three times as expensive as direct grid tying or hybrid battery plus grid tying. So batteries for the hard to um, put, you know, you take tunnels, for example. One of the excuses yeah. American uh, Railroad Association uh, says the American Association of Railroads, Association of American Railroads, A A A R. They one of the excuses they make uh, for not electrifying railroads is they'd have to rebuild tunnels to put catenary line overhead lines and have to heighten the tunnels. <laughs> but in Europe, they just say, "Oh, we'll just put a battery on the train, and that enables it to get through the longest tunnel." <laughs> Makes sense. It's not. It's, it makes sense. And, you know, so you kind of sit there with a battery pack that's in a container and you winch it off a train into a transshipment port and it charges. Oh, and then it, maybe it goes on a ship. Maybe yeah. one comes off a ship and goes on a train. It's just, that's going to be the pattern for the future because it leverages so much of what we do already. And so all inland shipping and two thirds of near shore shipping is going to be um, battery electric and mostly containerized. Um, that leaves only the longest journeys. Let's take um, uh, Shanghai to LA. Deep water. They kind of categorize. Well, they kind of, no, that's deep water. Okay. The deep water is crossing the ocean, mm -hmm. but running up a coast is considered near shore. But that can include Argentina to Guatemala. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Fair. You're, never out, you're never necessarily outside of land. You're never in deep water, but that's a long trip. Yeah. And so for those longer trips and crossing oceans, we're going to be using biofuels. Uh, a, a, a big a big ship might use 16,000 tons of resid today as fuel crossing an ocean. Wow. We're not going to replace that with batteries in this century. Yeah. But we can replace it with biofuels. Okay. Same, and exactly the same arguments. Now, here's a really interesting thing. So everybody's concerned about, well, biofuels, um, as I said, there's, you know, just using the stocks, we have enough for all marine shipping and aviation. Well, that's good news. That's not imposing on food supplies it's using waste streams. There are seven more biological waste streams which we can turn into biofuels, including animal dung, including vegetable oil grease uh, stuff, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And some of them use some hydrogen to supplement the process. Some of them don't, which I think economically will mean they'll we'll be favoring the ones that don't more. They'll be more competitive. But we have enough, and it's not going to impact food supplies. But let's look at the other side. What about air pollution? Human beings care about air pollution. It yep. makes us sick. It shortens our lives. Well, if all ground transportation and most inland and all inland and near shore shipping are battery electric and a lot of short haul aviation is battery electric, well, where is the air pollution occurring? Mostly over oceans, not yep. near humans. Um, and in this case, there's an argument to be made that, you know, it's imperfect, but the perfect is the enemy of the good enough. My argument is that it is good enough. And there's this other one nice little thing. Biofuels burn cleaner than fossil fuels. There's a lot less excess crap molecules in them that turn into nasty stuff. Like, we, here's actually a really interesting thing. A biodiesel or a bio kerosene has more energy in a liter than a fossil fuel equivalent. Wow. Yeah, and it burns clear because it's more of the stuff we want and less of the extraneous stuff that comes along with it from, you know, so go back 5 million years. Um, a T-Rex dies in a swamp, mm -hmm. right? All the biomass from the swamp, the stuff we like, is mixed with T-Rex skin and guts and stuff and the meat he ate from, you know, the, tr the Triceratops he ate for lunch. And so we go down a few futures, that's turned into sulfur and other crap, and we end up with these fossil fuels with weird stuff mixed in. Yeah. And we get rid of most of the sulfur, um, we get rid of other stuff that's that's problematic, but we still end up with fossil fuels, which have some a bunch of stuff in them, which isn't the burnable stuff that adds value. 
And so when we make biofuels, well, it doesn't have T-Rex mixed in. We don't throw a cow into the fermenters and the distillers. We don't do that. <laughs> we don't add sulfur. <laughs> uh, and so, you know, as we move forward, more energy density for a biofuel than for a fossil fuel burns cleaner because it doesn't have the trace elements. And in my projection, it's burned away from human beings more than not. And so we vastly reduce the impact, the health impacts of burning fossil fuels. We reduce noise pollution um, where people are. Yeah. Right. If you know, let's take Seville. Yeah, it's a port. It's got an airport, and it's got um, a lot of cars uh, and motorbikes. And it's got ground transportation. Yeah. Yep. And a train that you use, uh, yeah. by the way. I remember reading yeah, that. The high-speed train um, is great, takes though. much less time than trying to drive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and so you kind of like look at all those, and the high-speed train is undoubtedly electric. I'm mm. just going to say, grid yep. tied catenary lines. Um, and so you look, look at those, and all those sources of noise and air pollution go away, except for the airport longest haul flights, which will typically go away from land, and the longest haul shipping which will typically go away from land. Yeah. So then noise levels in the city drop, the air pollution quality improves, um, you know, uh, everything that it can be electrified will be electric. It's going to be a lovely world. Yeah. Uh, it's going to take us a few decades to get there. But, so that's all ground transportation electric, aviation increasingly electric, though, so by the end of 2100, all electric, biofuels, replacing fossil fuels, and then diminishing use in aviation over that period. For marine shipping, all inland, all nearshore shipping, most two-thirds of nearshore shipping, battery electric, mostly container batteries, and then the rest, biofuels. We're not going to replace 16,000 tons of biofuels with batteries this century. Sure. All right, so we kind of have to say we're going to be burning biofuels. But I've done the curves, and peak biofuel demand for aviation and shipping that's compatible with us getting to very low carbon emissions by 2060, 2070. Like it's like really amazingly low. I was like, the marine curve was just like, wow, this is actually a pragmatic achievable curve. And we're close to zero in 2070 and at like 5% in 2060. These are manageable numbers to manage the climate crisis. Um, but peak biofuel demand, smaller than all the, uh, the inflows that we have. Fantastic. It's, it's a very good news story. But it's running at a massive hydrogen height, which is preventing us from <laughs> just doing it. Anyway, so that's the story. I, I, I didn't let you get a word in edgewise, but that's, I know you like that. Isn't that's it? okay. You, you like to ask short questions and let the <laughs> guest ramble on. I'm a good ramble on guy. Good, 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 good. We are coming towards the end of the podcast now, Michael. Is there any question that I haven't asked that you wish I had or any aspect of this we haven't touched on that you think it's important for people to think about? Um, one of the big ones is why is hydrogen being considered so heavily for energy right now? Mm. Why is this hydrogen hype there? Why is the hydrogen for energy cult exist? And, um, the answer is who produces there's it? a lot of money in it. <laughs> well, it's not like who produces it. Um, it's who distributes it. Um, it's who uses it and it's the governments which get money from all of this process. Let's just take um, gas distribution. Do you have uh, natural gas in your home? No. Okay, but you know, you probably there's homes in Seville that do use natural gas for yeah, and cooking. Be, yeah. Yeah. Right, and so the natural gas utility doesn't exist in a few decades. Yeah, and its revenues and profits diminish, and it's a death spiral. Um, as every connection is severed, they have to spend the same amount of costs for all the distribution with lower revenue. And so there comes a tipping point when they're bankrupt because they're, and then nobody gets gas. Yay. Right. <laughs> so they're trying to avoid that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, I, I deal with industrial heat as well. Industrial heat is a 20% of global energy use and it's almost all fossil fuels. Mm. Um, and so when a, um, company like BASF with its integrated chemical plants goes to its supplier of heat, and says, how do we decarbonize heat? Well, the supplier of heat are fossil fuel suppliers. They supply gases and liquids that burn. And so they will say, well, they'll say the answer is, well, hydrogen is the answer because it's a 
gas that burns. They don't have a business model that says, let's put in electric induction heating because they are the suppliers of electric induction heating. They're not the suppliers of electric arc furnaces. They're not the suppliers of electroplasma torches. They're not the suppliers of heat pumps. And so, but the people who are answering, asking the question are asking of their current suppliers. Sure. And so there's this really interesting tribalism. These are people they've had probably had lunches and dinners and poker games with possibly for decades. They like these people. They're probably friends. They might live in the same neighborhood. <laughs> you know, you're going to say, well, you know, John, I, uh, you know that $20 million a year I give you sign off you know, every March? Well, goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, let's, take, uh, let's take Canada where I sit. Um, so 5 to 7% of our gross domestic product is from coal, oil, and gas. Right. As the federal government, despite being a uh, progressive government, which has put in one of the best carbon taxes in the world, you know, progressed up to 133 U.S. by 2030, and three elections have been fought with it as an issue. So this is actually Canada's behind this. But seven percent of GDP talks because that's seven percent of royalties flowing into governments, and that's ancillary economic benefits because. That's direct GDP. There's secondary benefits from that. There's um, housing and ship and retail businesses and B two B. It's all all coming off of that. And so you you kind of multiply by two two and a half to get the secondary benefit stream if you've got that big a chunk of your economy. And so the Canadas and the Norways, and the Saudi Arabias of the world, they all really need hydrogen from fossil fuels to be a thing. If it isn't, then their reserve value disappears. And, and you know, you know, if you have a, a trillion dollars worth of reserves of, of in natural gas, as Norway does, and it's gone, that turns into zero value. And if you've got like a trillion dollars worth of oil reserves, as BP might, and that turns into something worth hundred billion dollars. They're going to. It's really they're in their vested interest. So we're yeah. pushing. There's a lot of uh, cognitive problems there. There's also, there's also operational and capex problems. Back to this. Like there's the cognitive problems. There is the tribalism of your friend Fred, and you know you give twenty million dollars to a year, and he in return treats you to really nice dinners and loses <laughs> a poker tee and loses a golf tee. But then there's the capital cost expenditure. A um, a single big cement clinker is a five hundred million dollar capital expenditure. Refueling and that uses natural gas. It uses a jet of natural gas like ten meters long and five meters wide inside. Wow. So that's a lot of natural gas. And the alternatives we can do electric. Clinkers. They're actually experimenting with jet plasma jets, and we've had electric clinkers before, but they're not the same. You can't just replace the fuel in the capital expenditure. So you've got a capital expenditure problem. We've got very significant capital assets which are designed and built for fossil fuels. What are we going to do with them? Yeah. Maybe we're going to put maybe we're going to put something else in it. Maybe we're going to put biofuels, biomethane. Into them. Don't know. Um, but we can replace everything we need it, over time. It's all going to be electric. But then there's the next thing: electricity. When we're using it directly as heat, um, as you know, not as a heat pump, but directly as heat, is more expensive than using natural gas for heat. Right. You've got a sunk capital cost, and you've got higher operating expenses. No business likes that. They're going to resist that as long as possible. Sure. So we've got. A whole bunch of alignment in society. This massive industry, which is very has you know, the, the, there is a moral case for fossil fuels, and to be clear, that moral case for fossil fuels is now over. Um, you know, the moral case is an, if we if, if, when we didn't have replacements, yeah, there was a moral case. Now we have replacements. So, thank you very much. Uh, retire to your hacienda in uh, Portugal and uh, drink mojitos or whatever you drink and go down to the beach, work on your tan. Thank you very much. Get out of our lives. Um, like British gangsters. Um, we just don't <laughs> want them around anymore. Um, and so that's where we are with the fossil fuel industry. Great that they exist. They're going to be declining rapidly. 
like peak oil, peak coal was 2013. Peak oil demand is later this decade. Peak natural gas is mid next decade. And after that, it's a rapid decline for them. And so that's a fundamental shift. And that's why there's so much hype for hydrogen right now. Michael, that's been really interesting. Thanks a million for coming to the podcast today. If people would like to know more about yourself or any of the things we talked about, where would you have me direct them? LinkedIn, Michael Bernard, TFIE Strategy uh, Advisory Board with Limax. Uh, and what else is on there? Co-founder of Distance Technologies or my current hats that are formal. And then there's all the publications uh, through aluminum.com and cleantechnica.com. Perfect. Great, Michael. That's been excellent. Thanks a million for joining me on the podcast today. Tom, pleasure to be here. Great to chat with you or great to chat at you and, the, and your audience. <laughs> <laughs> it's been fun.